All right, good afternoon, everybody. We are very excited about today's study group. We are going to be covering the last chapter in Comrade Kwame's book, My Search for Answers, Truth and Meaning. And before we get started and we get into the actual reading, we'll go ahead and start with the statement of unity for the second Rainbow Coalition. Um, Sister Annie, do you, do you wanna, or Leslie, do you wanna read? Uh, okay, I'll read it. Um, this is the uh, preface to the statement of unity for the second Rainbow Coalition. And I just will add that um, different, lots of different groups are part of it, but this is uh, the document that is the glue that holds us all together. So the preface, the US was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and confining them to reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the eagle sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its Northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military interventions and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As Huey P. Newton stated, quote, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is a byproduct of capitalism, unquote. The working people of the world of every ethnic ethnicity or nationality face a common enemy that is destroying life on earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, health care, education, freedom from oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. <clears throat> the legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969 by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords and Young Patriots organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight against the capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the first Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a race struggle. He said that it's a class struggle, God damn it. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. 
The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, police courts, jails, prisons, and intelligent agencies, et cetera, in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14th, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original, original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the 10 point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriot Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we establish our programmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist imperialist ruling class represented by the Democratic Party and Republican Party cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what this second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is a historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All power to the people, boots on the ground. And um, all the members of the coalition, if I leave anything out, um, oops, go please go ahead and let me know. All right, uh, the new African Black Panther Party, the White Panther Party, the Green Party of New Jersey, the Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brown Berets, FURY, which stands for Feminist Uprising to Resist Inequality and Exploitation, NASO, North Alabama School for Organizers, New Era Young Lords, and the Guardian Rebellion. Did I get all of them? I believe so. Okay. I believe so, sir. All right. The six disciplinary rules. One, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Four, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Six, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. All right. Thank you, sister, for reading that. Welcome. Okay, so looks like we have, uh, let's see, Alyssa, Johnny's on as well. Kwame's able to join us today, so we are super excited about that as well. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with the reading. Um, what we'll do is if we can switch off when we get to like a break into, you know, where it has like the different uh, subsections. That way we have one voice kind of going through each one, if that's okay. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the first one. And I hope nobody just ate. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, oh. I had chili, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sis. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. I'm assuming that you read the chapter. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> okay. All right. It says, I'm going to I'm going to take a shit in the bathroom here or on lockup. I said, not budging from my position. So if y'all want to take me to lock up for needing to take a shit, y'all need to come on in and do that shit now. Uh, let me just say this. I have not heard the word shit so many times <laughs> in my life. <laughs> then it said in this section right here, but hey, it talks the point, right? Okay. The lieutenant who was called to my unit with the goon squad looked at me with the purple perplexed look on his face. I'm sure he had never been called to a unit where a prisoner was telling him what his options were and wasn't deterred by the threat of being sent to disciplinary segregation if need be. We were on lockdown at the time when this particular standoff had occurred. Since I was being housed in the six man dormitory part of the cell house, our door always stayed unlocked. Everybody else was locked down in their cells and could only come out of their cells if the guard in the control pod electronically opened it. I had no intention of letting them put me in one of the cells at the facility of the facility because none of them had toilets or running water in them. If you needed to use the bathroom at that prison, you had to wait for one of the guards to come around and get them to open your door. So you could use the communal bathroom that sat in the middle of the cell house. A lot of times the guys who were locked in the cells would have to revert to pissing and shitting in a bag because either they couldn't hold it or none of the guards had done their walkthroughs. After they finished pissing or shitting in a bag, they would shove the bag under their cell door and empty out the contents when they got up in the morning. I thought that was the most unsanitary, dehumanizing shit ever. That's why anytime they would ask me if I wanted to move to a two-man cell, I would decline. I couldn't see myself being in a cell where I would have to witness my cellie taking a shit in a bag or worse, having to do so myself. I liked the luxury of leaving out of my six-man dorm area and could go take a piss or shit in the middle of the night anytime I wanted. Since we were on lockdown, we had to wait our turn, however. The guards had skipped over us and said they were going to start letting the guys upstairs use the bathroom first. To make matters worse, they told us that they were taking a short break before they even started running them. Any logical person would have allowed us to use the bathroom since we all stayed in the same dorm area and often went to the bathroom anytime we wanted under normal circumstances. But instead of doing the logical thing, they expected us to wait an hour or so before they got around to running our dorm area. I wasn't going for the dumb shit, though, and I damn sure wasn't going to be shitting in a bag in front of five other guys. So I did what I had to do. I exited our dorm room and headed to the bathroom. That's when the pod officer had commanded me over the intercom to go back to my area. I paid him no attention and went straight into the bathroom. That's when he called the first responders on me. I turned around and waited for the lieutenant to come and place handcuffs on me. When he was taking too long, I turned back around and said, if you're taking me to lock up, let's go. I got to shit. He looked at me and said, man, go use the bathroom. After you're done, go back into your area. I thanked him and went into the bathroom to take my shit without any further incident. That was the first time the first responders were called to a unit on me, but it wouldn't be the last. That Lieutenant and I, who I will refer to as Lieutenant Sambo from here on out, got very, acqu got very acquainted while I was there. Anytime he was called to a unit and he saw that I was the one behind the standoff, he already knew he was going to have to give me what I was demanding or else I was willing to go to disciplinary segregation behind it. There were no other options. It was either or because they knew I wasn't deterred by any threats of being sent to lockup. They usually folded. After that incident, that set the tone for my last year in prison. I had made it up in my mind that my last few months in prison, 
I wasn't going to take shit from the guards. I had done most of my prison bit on disciplinary and administrative segregation units anyways. What was, what was another year on one of them when I had already done over a decade on them? I was probably the first prisoner they had ever encountered whoever, whoever threatened them with me being sent to lockup. <clears throat> I knew they hated having to pack up your property and do the paperwork for placing you on disciplinary segregation. So anytime they really were being unreasonable, I didn't mind threatening them with lockup. They hated for us to tell them what their options were. The facial expression on their faces when I did that was priceless. I took their main deterrent away before they even had a chance to use it against me. I was a complete enigma for most of the guards there, so they usually left me alone. The other prisoners thought I was crazy, but they respected the fact that I didn't take no shit from them, while most of them were quick to fold. <laughs> so that's the first, the first section there. Sister Leslie, you doing all right? I'm doing okay. I, <laughs> I want, oh yeah, <laughs> my chili. I think it's digested. Um, yeah, I'm more sorry for, I can't imagine having mm -hmm. to be like that. It's just, you know, dehumanizing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, um, it, Alyssa, if you have the trans, maybe she could read uh, okay. next, if it's okay. If yeah, she, no. yeah, sorry. All right, hold on one second. I got to pull it back up. All right. Um, the correctional industrial facility was a medium two, three, two, three level security prison. Everybody in prison still referred to it by its original acronym, CIC. When I first learned that I was being transferred to their general population, when I left the annex at Newcastle Correctional Facility, I was ecstatic. <clears throat> I had only heard good things about CIC. Everybody who was a short timer wanted to be sent there for the last few years in prison. <clears throat> but by the time I got there, it was all fucked up. Nothing was like it had been in the 90s. I don't think the guys in maximum security prisons had gotten the quote unquote updated memo about the facility, though. They had originally built the facility in 84 as a quote unquote honor prison. If you were sent there, you were able to procure a real vocational training that you could use upon your release from prison. Since they feed all the other state prisons, they had a pig and cattle slaughterhouse, meat processing plant, creamery, bakery, and vegetable processing jobs you could acquire. By the time you finished your time, you, could, you would practically know how to run your own farm and survive on your own. By 98, they had gotten rid of their slaughterhouses. By 2008, they had gotten rid of everything else. In its place, they had privatized the food we ate at all the facilities <clears throat> and had brought in a break refurbishing company. In order to work in the factory, you had to sign a waiver of liability form to prevent you from suing them if you got sick from the fumes and dust that came from repairing the old break parts. They would pay those guys less than minimum wages. I had no intentions of working in another factory my whole time in prison. I viewed the exploitation that occurred in prison as true modern day slavery. Besides when I learned that in order for you to work in that factory that you had to sign a waiver of liability, I knew they were breaking all kinds of health and safety rules. For the first several months at the facility, I refused to work any job. After a while, I decided to enroll in their business tech class primarily for the three month time uh did i say that right primarily primarily for the three month time cut offered but also because i figured that i would need some basic computer skills upon my release the teacher we had for business tech class was cool i think he truly wanted to help us learn most of us who have been down nearly two decades had never even heard about microsoft word or excel I got a chance to learn both of them, which came in handy when I got out and had to use Microsoft Word in order to write my autobiography. They had a few other programs at that facility that I thought were useful to the prison population. My favorite ones, which I didn't want to participate in myself, were the FIDO, Faith Inmates and Dogs Equal Opportunity, I Can, Indiana Canine Assistance Incorporated, and Nine Lives Program, Saving Cats. This was the first prison I had been to where they had dogs running around in the cell house with us. Michigan, Michigan City would 
let people have cats too, but CSC's programs were more about saving the animals themselves. Some of the animals were being kept until they could be adopted by someone on the outside. Some of the dogs and cats had been in deplorable conditions before coming there. So that was a way to save them from being euthanized. The ICAM program was a program that trained dogs to assist disabled people. Once the dogs had finished their training, they would be given to a disabled person on the outside. I think those were actually great programs that they had there because I saw how much it helped guys deal with their prison time. The bond they would form with those animals was grounding for a lot of them. I didn't want to have to be in a cell with a dog without running water or a toilet, so I wasn't willing to, willing to enroll in any of those programs. I did enjoy interacting with the dogs from time to time. I hadn't been able to pet and play with an animal in over 17 years, so it was something I did enjoy at that facility. Most of the time, if I wasn't in business tech reading a book or watching TV, you could either find me in someone's cell kicking it with them or playing spades. After being on some form of lockdown for eight years straight, it was different for me to be in general population where I could roam around, or excuse me, roam all over the day room or nearly all day. They didn't lock down the cell house until 10 p.m. every night. They would pop all the doors around 5 a.m. each morning. Our For our six-man dorm room, you can say that we were never really locked down like everybody else. Like I said, we would come and go even throughout the night. The day room was pretty huge. <clears throat> they were probably there were probably 30 cells on the top range and another 30 on the bottom each cell was double bunked in the middle of the day room there were about eight tables that could see up to four people at them which were bolted to the ground directly in front of them was a huge tv that anyone in the day room could watch since everyone had their own personal tvs in the cells most guys would mainly come out to socialize with others rather than watch tv Right under the TV was a podium with a chair where the floor officer would sit and watch everything going on in the cell house. In the middle of the day room, on the top and bottom ranges, is where our four communal bathrooms were. Both the top and the bottom had two nice-sized ones. Anytime we needed to use the bathroom, take a private shower, or even smoke with other prisoners, we could go into the bathroom, which was out of view of the floor officer. I ran into a number of people who I had grown up with or did prison time with at other facilities. It was at CIC that I ran into little John from my side of town. He and I had attended the same high school back in the day. He had we had caught our cases around the same time. We just had never found ourselves in the same prison on the same unit until they moved me here. I was initially apprehensive to run back into him. I had seen him a few times over the years in passing. A few times when I was on the shoe, I had been taken to the OSB building in order to attend a virtual video excuse me, to, to attend the virtual video conferences for the outside cases I had caught there. I had seen him in a GED class a few of those times and gave him a head nod. Instead of giving me one, giving me one back, he had just looked at me with a stoic expression on his face both times on different occasions. Another time when I went back to Marion County Jail, they had placed me on segregation and he was on the other side of the segregation unit. We were both locked in our cells, but I had yelled over to the side he was on when I found out that he was on segregation too. This was before he had been given the 60 year prison sentence. I told him who I was and everything. And he only responded with, oh. <clears throat> Those situations left me thinking that we had some beef that I didn't know anything about. So when I ran into him at CIC, I didn't know if I was gonna have a physical confrontation on my hands or what. My mentality was, if there was a possible beef with anybody, I could confront it head on. If it could be nipped in the bud, then so be it. If it couldn't, I wasn't going to let shit fester and have to watch my back all hours of the day and night. Besides, I was in the dorm area, which everybody in the cell house had access to all hours of the, time, of the day. From the time I had been around him on the streets, I knew he could be very unpredictable this was the same guy who I had witnessed beat the shit out of a guy for being hesitant about fighting somebody else. He was, he was no plaything. I, uh, so I definitely wasn't going to underestimate him. I will never forget the day I walked up to him and checked the temperature between him and I, I sat at another table across from him. And since they said, what's up, man, he responded with what's up back, but didn't say anything more. It was so odd that I, asked if he knew who I was 
He said that I looked familiar, but he couldn't recall where he knew me from. That's when I let my guard all the way down and started to refresh his memory. I was so shocked that I was having to do this. There was no question in my mind that he knew who I was. I figured that there had to be a reasonable explanation, and there was. He apologized and told me that he had a nervous breakdown when he first caught his case over in county jail. He went on to explain how he had been stabbed in the eye while there, too, which is why one of his eyes was now crooked. I was wondering how his eye got that way as he was talking to me. The more he talked, the more I felt sorry for whatever he had endured throughout his bit. I couldn't imagine having a nervous breakdown and my long-term memory suffering. Here I was, thinking that he and I were about to possibly fight over whatever beef I thought he had with me from the streets. He just didn't recall who I was. That fact that he, The fact that he didn't fuck me up because I had hung out with his brother numerous times. I personally knew who his brother was. And I sure was his and I was sure his brother would have been able to pick me out of a crowd of, th of a thousand after not seeing me for nearly two decades. That's how familiar I was with him in his life. Coming across him made me realize, again, how fragile the human mind can be when it's confronted with trauma. Man, bro, I said with a laugh, here I was thinking you had a problem with me after all these years or something. He laughed. Nah, I just don't remember you because of the memory problems I had after my nervous breakdown. We're good, bro. I... I feel relieved to know that, but you know how it is in here. You never know until you inquire. You were always good with me on the outs. I don't didn't want to come in here and have to look over my look over my back. You were a goon on the streets. I may not remember everything now, but I remember everything about you. I said with a smile. He laughed again. Now we're definitely good. I went to get my photo album so he could see pictures of me and my family over the years. The longer we sat and talked as he sifted through my pictures, the more his memories of me started to come back. After our reintroduction, he and I started hanging out all the time again. He introduced me to a brother named Devon. From that day forth, anytime you saw one of us, you knew the other two weren't too far away. <clears throat> Most of the time, I was either kicking it with little John or Devon in one of their cells. We would normally dialogue about shit we couldn't dialogue with other people about. Devon was into his teachings of the Moorish Science Temple, and Lil John had become a practicing Buddhist. When Lil John told me that, I thought to myself, well, damn, maybe he forgot something else, too, that he was one of the biggest bullies I had ever come across growing up. That was amusing to me. A Buddhist? What the fuck? <laughs> Whenever he would talk about his Buddhist outlook on life, though, I realized that he truly understood it from a deep metaphysical, philosophical dimension. The more he talked, I realized that my guy had become a real prison intellectual. As much of a bully as he was, and I reminded him again, just in case he forgot about that part of his life, I thought Buddhism had calmed him down a lot. Maybe he was just growing up and maturing. But I saw a few times that nobody should take his meekness as a sign of weakness. He could, he was so fuck a motherfucker up and med <laughs> meditate about that later. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so i enjoyed not only kicking it with little john but also establishing a close friendship with devon if i had been expressed uh if i had been impressed by little john and his newfound self i was fascinated by the growth and development of devon i hadn't even known him until i had met him there but i could tell that he had transformed himself into an to the intellectual giant that i had the pleasure to befriend he reminded me of myself. In his cell, he had a wide library of various subjects that uh, he had read or was reading. He was deep into metaphysics. So we conversed about the differences between metaphysics and dialectical materialism a lot. He was a true capitalist, but he would dialogue with me about my communist beliefs often. Ironically, he agreed with a lot of what I had to say about black liberation, but he had entrepreneur goals when he got out. And I understood that. But he was so much like me that I wanted him to see another way of living, of viewing, quote unquote, freedom. Up until the time I left prison, he and I had truly become best of friends. He was the brother who unknowingly helped prepare me for the best public speaking. Wait, pr uh, best prepare me for public speaking when I got out. He had a book in his library by Dale Carnegie called 
if I remember correctly, the art of public speaking that I read. I don't remember most of it, but I did walk away with the realization that there was no quote unquote formula to public speaking, so to speak. Uh, a lot of people before him thought there was. I took away from that book three main points. That one should know the subject matter that they were speaking about, be confident with, or to be confident which will bring out your passion and know your audience. I'm not sure if that's how Dale Carnegie would sum up his book, but that's what I inferred from what he was saying. I remember at Michigan City, I ran into a white guy who gave me the most profound answer to his own question to, to me. He had asked me if I could have any superpower in the world, what that superpower would be. To this day, I don't remember what my response was because his blew me away. He said that his would be being able to convey a complete thought every single time. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I sat back and thought about how powerful that would be. If a person was a lawyer and could convey a complete thought every single time he spoke, he would be able to win every jury trial and appeal. If a person was a politician, such a person would be able to win over a crowd. If that crowd was capable of being won over, if a person was a revolutionary, I figured he or she would be able to advance the revolution at all stages of its development. I never forgot his answer. When I read Dale Carnegie's book, I realized that all great speakers are great at conveying a complete thought. That's not to say that all of them knew what they were talking about but they knew their audience well enough to know how to win them over. I viewed that as a great power for someone to have, or I viewed that as a great power for someone to have because that sort of power could lead people to black liberation or be able to keep them from ever seeking it at all. It was a double-edged sword. From that day forward though, I tried my best to develop my speaking and writing skills with the goal of striving to always convey a complete thought. Want me to continue? <laughs> that was a pretty big section. Thank no, you. I realized thank, I'll get away. Thank you. I, I can read now. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Um, shortly after I had arrived at CIC, the facility was preparing to kick off their faith-based program. They had started moving guys into the C cell house on the side I was on and moving others to the other cell houses. I really had no intentions of leaving the dorm area I was in because I liked the quote unquote freedom of movement that it afforded me. I obviously wasn't a person of faith, but I knew a lot about all walks of life by reading various religious schools of thought over the years and interacting with those who upheld those views. So when the program started, I decided to sign up for it. My dilemma was choosing which religious faith I was going to start attending. In the end, I decided to join the Native American circle. My reason for doing so was to educate myself about indigenous people and their history in general. I had studied a lot about my own black culture and heritage, but had studied very little about the indigenous people's way of life. I had always admired the indigenous people for their courageous resistance against their colonial subjugation. When I was little and used to play cowboys and Indians, I had always chosen the side of the Indians. I never wanted to be a cowboy. I wasn't conscious then, but I identified with the indigenous people's struggle over the cowboys. Mm -hmm. I saw the indigenous people as the real heroes who had fought against the white colonial settlers. As ironic as it may seem, when I started to attend the Native American circle, I noticed that most of the people who attended it appeared to be white and of European descent. I always thought that was odd. Most of the white guys claimed to have had an indigenous ancestral background, but I didn't see any of that in their outward appearance. However, I stuck with it and generally came to embrace all the brothers who were a part of that circle. Besides, there had been rumors in my family that our great grandmother was a full-blooded Blackfoot. I didn't know how true it was, but I did see a picture of her before and she did look indigenous. Nevertheless, my cousin Courtney did a DNA ancestry 
Dot-com type of investigation herself years later, and she told me there was no proof of us having any Blackfoot or any indigenous blood in us for that matter. Some of my aunts and uncles to this day still swear that they do, that we do. From my sister Nika's Ancestry.com results indicated that at least she doesn't have any in her. She's 70% West African. Of that 70%, she's mostly Nigerian. I figured that my results would be similar to hers if I took the same test. At the time, though, I assumed that my great-grandmother on my mom's side had been a Blackfoot. To honor her, I wanted to know about my possible indigenous heritage as well. The Native American circle at the facility primarily practiced the Lakota tradition, however. It, I was cool with that because I already had great admiration for all indigenous people. The first time I attended, I learned about the Lakota's main god, Wonka Tonka, the great mystery. We sang songs about him that really grew on me. For most of those guys to appear white, they had a lot of rhythm. Maybe they did have indigenous blood in them because they could hold a beat. One of the main leaders of the circle was a black dude. He claimed to have had an indigenous background as well. How serious he approached his faith, I truly believed he did. He was very knowledgeable about Lakota traditions. I loved hearing him speak about the significance of some of their teachings. I learned a lot from him. One of my favorite indigenous stories he told us was about the two wolves. This is the story. Let me tell you all the story about the two wolves, he said as we all sat quietly and listened. A Cherokee elder was teaching his young grandson about life. A fight is going to happen, going to happen on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight and it is between two wolves. One is evil, he is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, self-doubt, and ego. The other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. This same fight is going inside on inside you and every other person too. The boy thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The elder simply replied, the one you feed. I always like that story too. <laughs> it was a short story, but it had a powerful message behind it. He would tell us more stories about various indigenous traditions but he mostly told us Lakota ones. One of all the rituals we did, I enjoyed going outside and doing the smudge. Big Wolf, I will call, Big Wolf, I will call him, would light sage and go around and have everyone inhale it and say his chant, this chant. I don't quite recall what we would all say, but the ritual was to cleanse ourselves while sending our prayers up to the great mystery on the smoke that emitted from it as the sage burned. We all took this ritual very seriously. Everybody stood in a circle very quietly and waited their turn. Anytime we didn't get a chance to go out and smudge and smudge due to security reasons, or we ran out of time to do so, some of the guys felt that their bad week was due to them not getting a chance to cleanse themselves of that negative energy. They all knew I was there more so to learn than the fact that I was a true believer in the great mystery, but I respected the Native American circle in and outside of those weekly meetings. To my surprise, it became a true brotherhood in which I often consulted for general support. The time I was in that faith-based program, I read several books about Native American history. My favorite indigenous hero was Geronimo. 
I read his autobiography and admired him greatly. I was a little disappointed when I learned that he had been captured and ended up converting to Christianity. It seemed to me that he just wanted to be at peace in his remaining years. So he did what he thought he had to do to keep the white settlers from seeing him as a threat. I understood that, but I had expected him to have been resistant to the very end. I still respected him greatly because I admired his resistance to colonial oppression. The main problem I did increasingly have with the faith based program was the fact that they had a lot of sex offenders who were a part of it. I would say that over half of the guys who had moved to C cell house were child molesters and rapists, two groups of prisoners I had persecuted at times in prison. Luckily for me, sex offenders couldn't be housed in the six man dorm area I stayed in. I had made it a rule that no sex offenders would be allowed in our area for any reason. I told the five other guys in that room with me that. It was only a matter of time before I caught one in there. I grabbed his arm and escorted him out like a child and told him that I better not catch him in our dorm area again. I didn't last too long in the faith-based program. All the child molesters started writing snitch notes on me, so they eventually kicked me out. Thank you, sis. I'll go ahead and read that last section. My last day in prison should have been my fourth day on the streets free. The night before, I called home and spoke with my mom. She had informed me that I was supposed to have been out the Friday that had passed. It was Monday. I guess CIC had fucked up the paperwork Sullivan County had sent them, indicating that I was supposed to be released early. I had gone to court a few weeks before and petitioned the court to modify my sentence. Since I served all my time on my bank robbery, I had flipped over to the battery case and I had caught against Sergeant Ash when I first came down. They had given me six months to do on that outside case. However, the state of Indiana had recently passed a law which was letting nonviolent offenders out of prison early if they filed a sentence modification. Well, I filed one and the judge on my battery case, which was a new judge, modified my sentence and placed me on house arrest for my last three months instead of having to serve it out in prison. The fact that they had fucked up my paperwork at Newcastle wasn't my problem. When I got off the phone with my mom the day before, her last words to me was, don't do anything stupid that, that could get you more time. She knew me better. She knew me better than to tell me that. They had brought that bottle of beer. CIC had me all the way fucked up. I told her to be at the prison by 12 in the afternoon. I will be out for sure by then. The next day, I approached three different sergeants a few hours apart and told them all the same thing. I'm not trying to cause y'all any problems, but I was supposed to have gone home Friday. Today is Tuesday. If I'm not out of here by 12 p.m., I'm going to lock this prison down. They all looked at me like I was crazy and said they would see what they could do. I gave them my name and DLC number and waited. I was so angry, but also so restless that the time seemed to tick by so slowly. When lunchtime rolled around, I don't even think I ate my tray. I walked back to the cell house afterwards, thinking about ways I would lock down the prison if I wasn't out in the next two hours. My solution to my dilemma was walking towards the same cell house I was headed towards, Lieutenant Sambo. I cut him off and cut straight to the chase. How's it going, Miller? Lieutenant Sambo asked. Man, look, I said, not wasting any time. I was supposed to have gotten out this Friday that just passed. Today is Tuesday. I've been down 18 years and I've served my time. You know me, I'm not trying to cause any problems. But if I'm not out of this prison in the next two hours, I'm going to lock this motherfucking prison down. He knew I wasn't playing. He had been called to several cell houses in regards to me. He knew I didn't make idle threats. 
Lieutenant Samba was definitely a house nigga and would be on bullshit with all the other prisoners. But he never figured out how to deal with me ever since he had folded to my demands and let me take that shit on lockdown. What cell house are you in, Miller? He said with a stutter. In the same cell, cell house with you, I said. You should have known that. <laughs> oh, okay, he responded. Let's go to my office and see what's going on. I followed him to the cell house and went into the office with him. He picked up the phone and called the classification department. I stood and listened to his conversation, knowing if they didn't get their shit straight soon, I was going to have to resort to drastic measures. Oh, okay, he said, speaking to someone on the other end of the line. So he's getting out today. He turned to me and said, they said you're getting out today. I just smiled, knowing that these long, agonizing years in prison were finally over. Okay, you said his mom is right there next to you and to tell him not to do anything crazy. <laughs> I immediately left the office and went and packed up all my stuff. I said all my goodbyes to everybody who were associates of mine and headed to the administration building. When I got there, I had to pass through several lock gates before reaching the release area. It was there that I was greeted by a guard who handed me the black hoodie, black jogging pants, and black pair of Nikes my mom had brought me to change into. I felt relieved that this chapter of my life was drawing to an end. The 18 long years I had served in the various prisons in Indiana hadn't been about rehabilitation at all. They were just warehousing us till our release dates. If you wanted to better yourself, your transformation was entirely up to you. When I read Fred Hampton Sr.'s speech the first time I went to the shoe, I didn't realize that it was going to be a crossroads that would take me down a new path with my life, a revolutionary path. I didn't know how and when I was going to join the revolution, but there was no question in my mind that I was going to when I got off probation. The quote by Frantz Fanon was the reminder that was etched down the side of my rib cage. It read, every generation must out of relative obscurity discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. I was definitely one of the wretched of the earth that Frantz Fanon was talking about. In order to achieve black liberation, I realized that our generation had to pick up where the original Black Par Panther Party left off. But this time we were going to have to see, to see it to its completion. So no other generation would have to suffer the aimlessness and the hopelessness that many of us had experienced. The dictatorship of the proletariat was the means by which we could achieve this. Fred Hampton Sr.'s Rainbow Coalition was the model for it. I had adopted the name Kwame Shakur, Shakur as my revolutionary name the last time I was on the shoe. I never went by it in prison since everyone already knew me by Day Day. However, I knew Day Day had died in me and Kwame Shakur was the new emerging chapter in my life that I would soon embrace. Kwame for me represented not only self-education, perseverance and meaning, but Kwame Che Shakur stood for resistance, just like Kwame Nkrumah, Ernesto Che Guevara and Asada Shakur. I realized that resisting my oppression was the only way I could truly maintain my human dignity and sanity at the same time. It was necessary to read books and develop theory, but like all Marxist, Leninist, Maoist before me, I recognized that it was through our practice of it that we would ever find liberation, true self-determination and meaning. As I walked out the front door of the prison with my mom and sister Nikki on March 1st, 2016, I thought about turning around and sticking up my middle finger but decided against it. There was nothing left to prove. My real struggle lied ahead of me. Prison had only prepared me to face it and fulfill the historical mission it had given us. And that is the end of the last chapter, chapter 22, and also the, the ending of the book. Um, we have the epilogue after this, but in terms of the book itself, this is it here. So, um, 
I'll open up the floor just to give people the opportunity to, to share their thoughts, questions. Um, well, I just want to point out, I think, uh, Kwame, this is an anniversary, right? Mm -hmm. March 1st, or March 6th, excuse me. Yeah, I didn't even March realize 6th. that. That's right. Yeah, March 6th. Uh, that's seven years. <laughs> when, I read, when I read that and I thought, mm -hmm. that's not really very long, you know, right. for, for you to have been liberated. Yeah. But, but we're glad you're with us. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad to be out here and boost on the ground with y'all. And I like how it ended and where I'm at in my life now. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Right. Right. Absolutely. So there's a lot in this chapter. There's a lot in this chapter. I'll, I want to take us back to the beginning of it. <laughs> I didn't think there'd be too much that I we uh, that we would add other than the obvious of you know how dehumanizing that first section is. Um, yeah. You know, and I think you know, it's it's so many aspects of of being behind the wall that you know if if you haven't experienced yourself which i have not experienced firsthand um but when you hear the stories you know and you read this section and it's just it's appalling right just just i won't even blow my nose in front of someone <laughs> you know what i mean like i literally will not blow my nose in front of people i will excuse myself and go blow my nose um, so I couldn't imagine, you know, having to go through, through something like this. Um, but you know what, what it is, um, uh, interesting to me is that there was, uh, an interview that Kwame Ture did in 1981. And, um, I'm kind of like sister Alyssa. If, if I don't watch much of the TV either, uh, you know, like mainstream mainstream stuff I'm usually listening to documentaries and things like this but so this morning um, <laughs> I was listening to this uh, this interview by Kwame Ture that had come up on my notifications and there was actually a part in there where he says the following he says everything is political where one eats goes to school where one lives even how one goes to the bathroom is political and I couldn't believe as I was listening to that, you know, because how many times have we not heard that, you know, about everything is political, but, you know, just having just read this chapter and it's starting off with this, you know, and then hearing that even how one goes to the bathroom is political, you know, just kind of threw me back. Well, he clearly wasn't wrong on that one. What's that? They clearly wasn't wrong on that one. <laughs> No, no, everything is political. And well, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the time frame like that he's talking about, like it literally was political. Like, mm -hmm. like or you could even drink from the same fucking water fountain was mm -hmm. was a thing of politics, a, a decision that somebody else was making. Right. And then again, just going to that quote of, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Mm -hmm. Because really, just it hasn't really changed you know we just read this chap this chapter here in that section there it's like has has anything really changed nope. not much nope. <laughs> I every time that I'm like listening to a podcast or any of those kinds of things it's like all right when when are we talking and then I'm like all mm -hmm. of the exact same like I don't know I was I can't remember what it was but it was like you know um that we're here in 1992, we're still fighting the revolution, whatever. And I'm like, okay, 1992, it is. So that was 31 years ago. <laughs> exactly. You know, and then that's that's probably one of the more modern, you know, mo most modern things that I can even bring up. Mm -hmm. Always talking about the same the same stuff, essentially. Yeah. Just, yeah. Maybe it's a little bit prettier. Maybe it's a little bit neater. Mm -hmm. Just repackaged differently. Correct. Well, yeah. I, I think you're, you're right, Veronica, to point that out. It's like 
some of these personal things really drive home our class position to us. Like, um, you know, one of the most embarrassing things to me ever, well, we were, we were living in West Virginia. We lived in a trailer and we just were so broke. There was a period of time where we didn't have work. I mean, we were barely able to just scrape everything together. And I was pregnant with my third child. I was so pregnant. I mean, he was born August 6th, right? And it was in August and I didn't even have money for, for deodorant. And mm. I'm, I'm such a, I'm one of these clean freak girls, right? I mean, I remember when I worked in a plant, like a chemical plant, you know, the men used to make fun of me. Uh, they go, I've never seen you dirty. <laughs> because <laughs> I would put these paper suits on that we had and if it got any dirt on it I would take it off right and get a clean, get a clean one so not to have deodorant and be pregnant in the heat and everything and there was this cousin of of Andy's that came they didn't even call us to tell us they were coming he just showed up at the door and I became aware of the fact that I had BO, you know, I was standing there and I mean, I, it makes me want to cry right now, just thinking about how embarrassed I was mm. uh, at that time. And it, it was all due to poverty, you know, and other, other things. It's like, I was thinking about that today about, you know, like how anxious I am for spring because in a, in a person's house, I mean, we're not, we don't look at ourselves as devastatingly poor, but our landlady, she doesn't turn the heat on. So we're cold all winter, right? I mean, I've got a little electric heater. I'm keep my, keep my legs warm and stuff. So, you know, I remember a friend of mine in West Virginia, she, she used to say to me, you know, when she described the difference between the poor and the wealthy. And she said, the poor people's houses are always cold in the winter. And, uh, you know, these are, these are the things, I think these real human things, right? Where we can't, we can't afford to keep up certain standards and that's kind of like what they were doing to these guys in prison. I apologize for the noise. I think my neighbors are vacuuming right up over me. <laughs> it sounds, so sounds like thunder, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, what, what they're doing to these people in prison is like, they're just pushing them down, you know, to the lowest level where they can't have the simplest dignity, um, you know, sort of like what we've come to be used to as civilized. I mean, even poor people can go into the bathroom and close the door, right? Unless the door doesn't work. <laughs> I've had that too. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just really brings it home how barbaric mm -hmm. this system is, you know? And like, if you look at the situation, like, well, I mean, look at those kids children and families on the border, right? That they have imprisoned and, you know, having to lay around on the cold cement with these silver blankets, you know, that they throw to them. I mean, they're trying to get people used to the idea that it's okay to treat human beings like animals and that we're supposed to be glad that at least they are feeding them and letting them have a silver blanket um, that this is supposed to be humane treatment and um, I mean I was so happy to see people go down to the border and you know like uh, these church groups and these Jewish uh, women who went down there you know with their signs never again because it's like Nazis. It's like the stuff you see in concentration camps, right? Uh, and, and this is going on right here. I mean, we've had second rainbow people bring this to light here in Chicago, that there are children locked up in houses. They're, they're these uh, uh, children of immigrants without papers 
and they have got them imprisoned in these houses here in Chicago. I mean, you don't even know where they are. And these organizations like Heartland and, you know, these nonprofits are uh, people who are going around like they're uh, such a, you know, they're liberal groups, they're so good, they do good, et cetera. They're, they're the ones responsible for this. So the, these things are creeping in to the society you know, at all levels. And I think it's, uh, well, I was really glad to see that our rainbow group was out there exposing, exposing this. That's all. Absolutely, sis. And, you know, it, it, brings, it brings to my mind, you know, certain things, uh, you know, like you were mentioning with the anniversary date, it, it wasn't too long ago, you know, what, what Brother Kwame is describing here. Um, and, and even to this date, there are things that are still happening. I'm sure that none of this has changed that he's described throughout the whole book, right? Um, you know, I think it was the last chapter where it talked about people being left in the shower uh, they go in to take a shower and, and they'd be left there for hours, 14 hours into a new day in the shower, you know? Um, people sleeping on the floor, you know, where I think, <clears throat> again, those of us who have never had that experience or, or have known somebody who, who has been uh, incarcerated and, and being able to hear the stories of the conditions is that you know we we just may naively assume uh, some or visualize what what this looks like, but in the second section, and I don't know, Brother Kwame, if you want to elaborate more on this uh, medium two three level security um, and what that means. Uh, I think it's a combination, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, of what would be, you know, some cells and then open dorm style is is that what the two three level security would be yeah well this prison was unique in its own uh right uh the cells like i said i've never been to a prison where it didn't have running rock water mm. and a toilet in the cell you know what i mean just think about that like yeah. if a co don't come around and let you out to use the bathroom you got to use it in a bag. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, piss and shit in a bag while your, your cellmate is in there. You know what I mean? That's humiliating. And then you shove it under the door uh, mm -hmm. so you can get it when uh, they roll the doors again uh, for breakfast and stuff. And you empty out all the contents. And... Uh, and and the toilet, like like who like what type of inhumane stuff is that? You know what I mean? And um, this luckily they had a dorm area that I was sent to that was like I said inside the cell house that was its own little area, but is a part of the day room where we could go in and out all day, all night, all day. You know what I mean? And use the bathroom anytime we want. Uh, the counselor was trying to get me to go uh, get uh, get a cell when the cell opened up, but I was like, hell no, nah, I'm staying right here. Why would I want to go in there? And I got to ask to use the bathroom, and I'm seeing all these other dudes sit and piss in the back and shove it under the door. Like, hell no, nah, I stay here and be able to use the bathroom whenever I want. And it just so happened that when I got there, though, it was a lockdown, and they they just bypassed us and figured, ah, uh, we can hold it for another hour. You know what I mean? I'm mm -hmm. like, man, hell no, nah, I'm not going to hold this. Like, my door is open. <laughs> I'm about to go out there and use the bathroom. What you mean? <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? So, uh, yeah, it was, It's a, and it's still going on to this day. Uh, the last person that hit me up from CIC, it's still like that. Like, they still don't mm -hmm. got toilets and running water. And it's been mm -hmm. like that for years. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think people out here need to know about that stuff. You know what I mean? I, I'm pretty sure that's some type of uh, Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment right. violation. You know what I mean? That they committing on them brothers in there. You know what I mean? 
So mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted to point those conditions out so people will see how how like we're put in situations that normal people out here be like, why did he snap off? Well, shit, uh, you use the bathroom anytime you want, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like nobody wants to be in those type of uh, conditions. Nobody wants to be humiliated like that. You know what I mean? And uh, I think one of the things this chap chapter points out too is that like the closer and closer I got to getting out, the more and more I, I was more aggressive against them because now all these years y'all kept me on lockdown uh, and now I'm around y'all. <laughs> like I'm not <laughs> going for this bullshit no more. I did so much lockup time. Mm -hmm. You can't even threaten me with lockup. I'm going to threaten you first. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to threaten you first. And then when I threaten you first, you're going to look so stupid that you like, nah, I'm not going to see him to lock up. You know what I mean? Like that was uh, <laughs> some ironic stuff that I realized, uh, that I started to use against them is that, you know, they was so used to people being scared of going to lockup. But a person that did over 10 years on lockup out of 18 years, y'all took the fear of lockup out of me a long time ago. You know what mm. I mean? So you realize you can't do nothing to me. You know what I mean? You already did the worst you could ever do to me. So now I'm like in this free zone where I can do as long as I was, I was in the right. I was able to get a lot of stuff uh, done that other people uh, that they would uh, just just disregard their civil liberties, their privileges, or whatever in there, and and they would run all over them dudes. But to me, for me, they treated me different because they was like, "Well, this is a dude. We can't even scare him with lockup. He's scared. He he starts shooting off the threat us with lockup first. You know what I mean?" <laughs> Like that was so unpredictable for them, so they pretty much left me alone. But I also wanted to include in the, in this chapter how like I was did like this all the way to my last day, literally in prison. You know what I mean? Like I was supposed to go home five days earlier. I find out that I wasn't uh, uh, that I wasn't told about. You know what I mean? And to my last day, I was like, look. I would shut down this whole motherfucking prison if y'all don't let me out of here. You know what I mean? But I knew I was in the right. Like, y'all in the wrong. I was, I've been in here five days past my out date. You know what I mean? So y'all know y'all got to get this right. So me taking an extreme measure like that, I knew would get me some results and stuff. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But the main thing is showing that in order for people to maintain their human sanity and dignity, uh, you have to resist. Like, that's one thing I concluded that cap chapter with. That's what kept me sane, where I I saw other people go, like, lose their mind, literally lose their mind. I talked about that on several occasions. People lost their mind. But I think that was mm -hmm. one thing that fortified my mind, inoculated my mind, is that I always resisted. Always resisted. I never succumbed to all the dehumanization. Like, I always stood up for myself and everybody else around me. And I think that's a lesson that we can learn out here. We got to keep on resisting. We cannot succumb or we just going to become hopeless and we're going to start to deteriorate mentally, physically, socially, culturally, all the way around the board. Right. Brother, I've heard I've heard this notion that there's a difference between uh, a convict and an inmate. Have yeah. You, have you heard that? Yeah, a convict, uh, for people that's been in prison, uh, an inmate is a person that's just, like, goes along with the process. Uh, <laughs> he goes along to get along? Yeah, and, and a lot of the inmates, they, they will go against even the prison population to get privileges, not go to lock up. You know what I mean? They're the ones that are being broken in, you know what I mean, or opportunistic. But the convicts, mm. we, we use that word very, very subtly in prison because it, it's hard to come across convicts nowadays. And that's so ironic because when I first came down, it was a lot more of them. Uh, mm. It was less and less of them by the time I got out of prison. Now, when I talk to people in prison, they tell me all the time, they're like, bro, this is crazy in here. Like everybody is, in here is just like, passive and docile and going along with this stuff. It ain't no, 
and a lot of people like us in here, uh, bro, still, <laughs> you know what I mean? They've broken a mm -hmm. lot of people. But convict mm -hmm. was the person that stood up for all the prisoners. A convict was willing to go to lock up like that guy, Kitty, uh, that witnessed that brother get killed in, uh, in Wabash Valley Correctional Facility when I first came down. He went to lock up for a whole year because he wouldn't go along with the program. That was the way to show them, okay, since we can't break you and make you uh, uh, go along with the cover-up, then we'll just send you to lock up for a whole year. You know what I mean? That's what a convict would do. A convict would even stand up where where this this convict right here might be an Aryan Brotherhood, and I'm a revolutionary, but we out here standing up against the pigs collectively because we recognize our conditions is the same. You know what I mean? It was a lot of those convicts as well, and we distinguished that. This is a white supremacist that realized, look, we under the same conditions, and we got to fight together. You know what I'm saying? We might not agree ideologically. Outside of these prison walls, we might be the complete opposite opposition, but in here, we got to fight and stand up together. You know what I'm saying? That's what a convict was, and we made those distinctions in there, but we rarely use that word convict mm. in there because you know, a lot of people, uh, you use it and then you'll find out something happened. Now they are already like cop and going against everybody. But like, damn, I thought you was a convict, my brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So to be called a convict was really a sign of the highest respect from some of the, mm -hmm. uh, the other prisoners in there. And few people ever got that that uh, title attached to their name <coughs> by, by someone. Mm -hmm. uh, Veronica, I noticed we got three people with their hands up. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, Sid. Oh, oh it's okay. <laughs> All right, who we got? <laughs> oh, you can't see. It's Shimako, Zombie, and Sister Anna. Okay. I think Shimako is first. Okay, Brother Shimako. How you doing, brother? Do you guys hear me? Do you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. First off, my apologies. I'm helping my wife move, as you can see, with all the stuff. Fun and stuff. I, my, I left my phone at the house. We were at Home Depot grabbing supplies, so don't mean to leave folks hanging. Please forgive me for that. Um, I want to talk about the dehumanization thing, and it's not really comparable, but it kind of is. Um, so, you know, I don't know if anybody's been to, like, shelters, uh, like homeless shelters, Yes. Uh, but, you know, I, I stayed in a, a shelter in Seattle and, you know, like they, it, it's kind of just one of those situations where they I mean, I mean, they say it's for security. Right. So that people right. aren't, you know, um, like shooting up or doing drugs in the stalls. But I mean, they have stalls, but the stalls have no doors. They might as well just have those stalls. So, you know, everybody's just shitting out in the open. And it's it's I remember that the same place I stayed. You know, they give you out the blankets at night. And uh, I remember one night I was, uh, you know, I just started itching. And I was like, why am I itching like this? And uh, I went upstairs, man, I think I'm having an allergic reaction to this blanket. And uh, the, um, the night attendant was like, I don't think that's what it is. Look on your shoulder. And there was a big ass bed bug on my left shoulder. And yeah. so it turned out that the blankets that they had given me were like bed bug infested. And, you know, I woke up that morning, I had, you know, the bed bug bites and the spider bites. And, you know, then on top of all that, like, there's no place for you to store your stuff when you go to these shelters, right? So you go to these shelters, you get your bed bugs, you know, you shit in front of everybody, and then you take your ass back out in this world, you know, mm. like at 6 a.m., carrying right. two, 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 three bags of your stuff, and somehow you're supposed to build from that. <laughs> right get a job get a job right, right? right, right, right. <laughs> get out now get out there and be somebody you know right. and and it's just um you know the institutions that they create um you know they, they, they design for like reformation or rehabilitation or you know for for uh uh you know pulling yourself up by your bootstraps what they seem to all have in common is they they tend to do the exact opposite uh, yep. which is just you know tear people down from an already impossible situation. So I just wanted to share that little piece, Pass. That's perfect, brother, thank you. No, this is actually kind of what was like going through my mind as well, because I'm actually over here packing up um, boxes to go to my next distro at one of the 
shelters. Well, it's actually a warming center. It's not even a freaking shelter. And they're trying to close it down in Rhode Island. Um, it's the same thing. They have porta potties outside. They have, well, originally it was supposed to be like an actual shelter, 350 beds, blah, blah, blah. There's 50 fuck cots. And, um, you know, people are literally choosing to sleep in their cars, but at least they have a parking lot, you know, to, to feel somewhat safe in or whatever. Um, there is bathrooms inside, but you can't use them. Only the staff can use them. Um, you're only allowed to change your clothes on certain hours of the day. And like Chamaco, like these people don't know. I don't think that they necessarily have to get out at a certain time. And they do have somewhere that they can store it, luckily um in this circumstance but like say they have an accident or they get wet or whatever the case may be they have to sit in their shit for however long until that hour mm. until the door it's like what what kind of benefit is i mean and, and these people and it's really sad to see because like i'm sitting there like getting fired up for them while i'm talking to them and they're like yeah but we're really grateful that they even have this place open and stuff like that and i'm like but that's that's sick shit like they're just they're they're giving you scraps and and basically like you you have to be thankful because you're not literally outside but and it's wild too like one of the guys that i was talking to is a veteran who was stationed at the armory that he is living at as a homeless man at like 70 years old mm. like that's just gross gross okay i'm done yeah completely heartbreaking completely heartbreaking um we have sister anna and zombie also have their hands up i'm not sure who was first uh sister zombie would you like to go ahead and you want me to wait or you want me to go ahead um it doesn't matter i it doesesn't matter they uh Alyssa and shimako kind of touched on what i wanted to talk about too so i mean if you want me to if you want me to put my two cents in, or if you want to go, that's fine. Yeah, I'm afraid that I'm gonna I'm a signal out again. All right, you first go. Of all, thank you, thank you, humbly. I just want to first say, uh, Brother Kwame, it take a very strong person to write uh, about your life story. And it's a story that will, of course, help us to grow. And I have the pleasure to be a part of this uh, project and um, continue the blueprint of what our legendary rate has written for us to stay apart as far as uh, partake as far as political education is concerned. And um, everyone who's uh, part of uh, the Second Rainbow Coalition, um, it is so important for each and every single person, revolutionary, to continue to read. This is a safe place for you to grow as a revolutionary and to build your confidence in reading and reading out loud. Um, there are some people that I came across who don't like to read, and I can understand that. But when you have a support of people who's focused on pushing something like reading, there should not be one revolutionary that cannot find time to take an hour or two to devote to, to a project like this. Um, my question to um, Brother Kwame is, man, I have lost my frame of thought, but um, if you can speak to your younger self, which I raised this point, what would you tell yourself as you had experienced everything that you did as a revolutionary. And with this book, this go out to everybody else as my second question. How has this book have grown or enhanced your path as far as in, in the journey as a revolutionary? Black Power. Thank you, uh, Sister Anna, that's a good question. Uh, this, this, I, I would tell my former, uh, my younger self to read this book. Because <laughs> I'm talking to him. I'm talking to him. I'm talking right. to him. Like, this was to, this was a healing process for me. You know what I mean? Where, uh, you know, life was aimless at a lot of times. I felt hopeless. I felt suicidal. I felt angry. You didn't want to say I didn't feel no, I felt a lack of meaning. You know what I mean? In my life. 
And I wrote this book for people like me, you know, to show like, hey, it might look bleak right now, but it's actually answers to a lot of the stuff that you're seeking. It's actually a different way of life that you can go about your life than what you're currently doing. Uh, it's different relationships that you can build with people that, like, I look at everyone on here is people I could reach out to. You know what I mean? And uh, if I needed a, just, like, someone just to uh, talk to about anything I'm going through or different things I'm, I'm needing uh, advice on, I feel like I can call upon every single person that's on this call right now. And it's a lot that's not on this call, and I feel the same way about them. You know what I mean? And that means a lot to me, you know what I mean, to have these type of relationships. So that's one of the things I would say. But beyond uh, saying, as to telling my younger self to pick up this one book, y'all remember when I talked about that <laughs> in the uh, former chapters when uh, my guy buddy was trying to get me to read? He was like, mm -hmm. and I was like, well, look, man, I'm going to read this one book. And after I get done with this one book, I'm not going to read none of these conscious books no more so stop coming at me like that but i think if my younger self would have picked up this one book i would have hit a core with him you know what i mean but i would beyond that i would say i would tell him to uh keep searching man keep searching like pick up a book and and, and you don't have to be a conscious book to start off just uh start off with something that sparks your interest and let your interest take you to uh, answer some of these questions that you're frustrated with. You know what I mean? I would tell him that your rebel spirit that you have, keep that. Don't let that, don't ever lose that. That's going to get you through some of the hardest times in your life. Keep that. You know what I mean? That's going to actually help you become the person that you need to become and the contribution that you're going to make to your generation. That fighting spirit it's going to give a lot of encouragement and motivation and inspiration to other people to keep on struggling, to keep on resisting. You know what I mean? I would have I would have told him to learn about the Black Panther Party. I think if you uh pick up, uh, hey, just if you don't want to read this book, check out YouTube about uh, channels about the Black Panther Party, documentaries, Rainbow Coalition. Check out some of Fred Hampton's speeches. I think all those would have gave me uh, put me on a trajectory to where I became, uh, became a revolutionary eventually. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, that's that's what I would tell my younger self. And uh, I think that's a good question because that really um, is like how we talk to other people out here in society. Uh, everyone has to be reached differently. Like no one can be reached the same, but that's part of the, uh, the, the self-reflection uh, that's necessary when we when we reach out to other people. Remember where you was was at one time in your life. You know what I mean? Uh, everybody ain't going to read that book. Everybody ain't going to uh, want to look at what you're talking about from a logical standpoint. Some people still living it, got bitterness and trauma and stuff that they're uh, affected by. You know what I mean? Remember when you was at that time. You know what I mean? And uh, I think it helped us uh reach a lot of these uh people that's suffering uh to overcome those and, and get on the same revolutionary path that we're on now absolutely absolutely i thank you again so um my second question that uh i just want to also raise to everybody that's on the panel which i thank you all for your commitment your dedication to this project and it just shows your, your persistency and um, how consistent you are as a revolutionary. Um, what would you say on how this book can uplift you or help you along your, your journey as a revolutionary? This is to anyone. I'll jump in, I'll speak to that, sis. Um, but I do want to acknowledge we did have a few uh, a few comments. Maybe we can come right back to that question, sis, um, sure. if you don't mind. Um, just no because problem. I think it, I just don't want to leave anyone out. We had zombie. Did you still did you still have a, a comment? And then after zombie, uh, brother Shamako. Yeah, I just had a. So when I was as I was listening to 
everybody reading and then thinking about what Kwame said um, about how they so dehumanize the, the inmates. And I'm thinking about it and I'm like, you know, they, they dehumanize these inmates. They treat them like they are animals. And then I find it interesting that they then flip that you know, it's, it, I'm, I'm sitting here going, this is so psychological because they then flip that and present them as animals to the general public. Right. When they created that situation yeah. to begin yeah. with. So, you know, what they're doing and like Alyssa said, they do it in the shelters. You know, you treat these people like subhumans and then you turn around and present them to the general public as subhumans mm -hmm. so that the general population has less of a like a guttural response when they see what's happening because well they're just the animals anyway you mm -hmm. know and now we see it you know we we all talk about we got to get boots on the ground we got to get out there on the streets they're doing the same thing to protesters they have this terroristic organization out there randomly killing people and randomly imprisoning people and mm -hmm. then that same terroristic organization our response to that is to take to the street and then they flip the script and we're the terrorists mm -hmm. <laughs> and i just i just really found that fascinating you know, when when Kwame was talking, and when this this was a good chapter, Kwame. I mean, the whole book has been good, but this was this was That's a powerful chapter. <laughs> you know, this, you know, this, this was a powerful ending chapter because it makes you mm -hmm. it makes you realize you follow all those little threads, and they use all of these systems to dehumanize people and then present us as less than human to the rest of the population. And I just thought that was, that was fascinating. That was fascinating. That was all, it was just something that was running through my mind when I was listening. Absolutely. Brother Shamako, you're up next. Yeah, so I'm gonna do three things real quick. So one is in response to Sister Anna's question, I think one of the things that's been really, I don't know, this is kind of overly simple, but just cool to experience in this book is I don't feel like, and I mean, I, I don't feel like there are a lot of revolutionary authors mm -hmm. from, from our generation. Right. I feel like there's a lot of political authors Yes, but I don't feel like there's a lot of revolutionary authors, and a lot of the experiences you shared, just like the regular ones, just like the stuff with the homies, and like basketball, and <laughs> you know, like my cousin's name Devon and my sister is named Nikki. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I, yeah. felt, I felt this book personally. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I'll start with that. So and then I have a question for Kwame, and I have a question for everybody. So the question for Kwame is looking back on the book process itself, if there is something you could do differently or if there is advice you could give to an author or a potential author thinking about writing a book, what would it be? And then for everybody, since we're talking about dehumanization as a problem, what does everybody feel like their personal and our collective response to dehumanization should be? Ooh, excellent. That was a and good then, uh, question, comrade. I want to say to first to you and Zombie, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I, I like hearing that from y'all makes me feel like the reason I wrote this uh, book is being recognized. Like I wanted uh, to write as a revolutionary for our generation, not just a political person or anything. And I wanted to talk about a condition that is. I don't see a lot of books talking about prison, like really what's going on inside prison. Why 
mm. the prison liberation movement is critical to the revolutionary movement. And yeah. um, so I'm honored that y'all really took a lot out of this book. It was inspiring. It was motivating. Um, one of the things that I say I will, if I had to do this over, I would have put one other thing in here politically. And I speak about this a lot anyway, so it's not like somebody's not going to get this from other sor uh, uh, sources of where I spoke about this. But I would have talked about the origin of white supremacy with the Bacon Rebellion and how they ut mm. utilize that to divide the, our class. And why are we in a situation where we got Trumpers and stuff, uh, you know, that's lower class uh, white people that's holding on to uh, a tokenism, because that's really what it is, white skin privilege. Uh, for a poor white person, is tokenism. Like you're, 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 you're getting crumbs. Like you're not even a part of the real empire. You're not even a part about the the real imperialist design of benefiting from all this shit. You know what I mean? I think I would have put that in there uh, to explain the origin of it. Plus, that would have been a, a response to different black nationalists and black separatists that try to make it seem like all white, all white people is just racist or or come up with some black supremacist uh ideology or philosophy like all white people is always innately devils and that's not true man that's not even you don't you got to know the history of how this stuff even came about so i think i would have added that uh, but besides that the writing process i'm trying to get my wife to uh write her autobiography now you know what i mean or at least uh talk about what she's doing with the missing struggle but I'm, I, I encourage all revolutionaries that we all got a story. And just like my story inspired y'all, y'all story uh, will inspire a lot of people as well. You know what I'm saying? And I encourage people, uh, the writing process is really starting off just writing. Like I didn't know, I didn't really know how this stuff was going to finally come together. Uh, I wrote this autobiography like five times in prison. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even get my voice until that last year in prison when I met Devon and he let me read that book by Dale Carnegie about the art of public speaking. And I was like, bam, that's what it is. That's what it is. You know what I mean? That's how, that's my voice. And that's how I'm going to speak from now on. So everything that came out of here came from that epiphany moment. You know what I mean? But all that practice in between then of just writing and telling my story, like that was uh, building the structure of the chapters. So when I did come by, back and find my voice, I already know how I wanted to structure it to uh, tell my story. I just needed the voice to fill in that structure. You know what I mean? So I would just encourage people that do have that. If you ever thought about writing an autobiography, just start writing. You know what I mean? Just yeah. start writing. Yeah, just start somewhere. Like they say, uh, 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 a thousand mile journey starts with the first step. You know what I mean? And the first step is just writing. Put your thoughts on paper and, and don't get so caught up in the 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 punctuation and the uh, grammar and all that. Just talk like, like we're talking right now and just wow. get it off your chest. You know what I mean? Of what you want to say and convey about your life. Uh, you'll know when the writing process is complete because you'll feel this sense of validation where it's like, okay, I'm done. Like I can exhale. Like it's been, I, I can live with this that I'm going to put out that's going to always speak for who I was. You know what I'm saying? And don't be fearful of uh, sharing those vulnerabilities of your life because it makes it more complete, more humanizing when you can be vulnerable and tell about the the mishaps in your life, the times that you was dealing with depression or suicidal thoughts, or if you was molested or whatever it was, you know what I mean? It, may, it humanizes it and shows you are a human just like all of us. That's the connecting right. part. You know what I mean? People got to right. be able to relate to you. They got to know that you're a real authentic human being. Like it don't have to be a Superman story, a superwoman story. You know what I mean? The superwoman, super uh, man. Uh, super superwoman, superman story is the 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 humanness of it. You know what I mean, and how you overcame it and became the person who you are today. So that that's my advice. Oh, Veronica, Veronica, sister Veronica. 
Yeah, that that is good advice. I mean, I got real interested in writing too. You know, Andy and I do. Uh, we write stuff all the time, and you know, pass it out in the community and stuff. But I remember a real good piece of advice is, is along the lines of what you're saying, uh, Kwame. And that is like, like for instance, the lady said, um, you know, like a book that's on birds, a bird anthology. And somebody said, well, how do you write a book uh, on bird anthology? And she said, bird by bird. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was such a good you know, it's a good, good way to start you know you got to do it a little bit a little bit but it's going to take on a structure after a while and you're as certainly Kwame you're an example uh that this can be done and I'm not saying it, it your book is like something anybody could do but the fact that you hit the books yourself and studied and tried to perfect your craft it, it's a super compelling book and it's very natural, you know, like even reading it. I like reading it because, um, I mean, I love a good story. Not, you know, not even political stuff. I, I just love a good story. I, I got behind, I don't know if anybody ever read the Warrior Cats. <laughs> I, I just love those stories. There's real escapism, but it's just, it's just a story, you know, that's compelling and you keep going on. It's like cliffhangers and stuff. Well, that's kind of the way life is, right? I mean, stuff happens and develops and you have had an exciting life, even though it was in a bad, really bad place. So to write about it the way you have, I think it could have an impact and I am uh, anxious to see it be distributed more widely. I think it's a shame that the prisons have, uh, you know, become an even more oppressive and, uh, you know, have um, censored it and not allowed it to get in. But it's definitely something that um, a lot of young men uh, and women too, you know, should be able to listen to. So I don't know, that's something to think about how we could continue like reading circles. Because I, I was gonna say that the reading circle that we've had um, has been extremely inspiring to me. Um, oh. I mean, well, I, I think I told you all a, a little bit about my history. I don't wanna, you know, get into a big thing about condemning people or anything like that but I had just come off a pretty hard situation where the seemed like the rug had come out from under me. We were in a organization all our adult life, gave everything to it, right? And um, it's gone, it's going revisionist. It's going wrong, you know, starting to vote, vote by like your life depended on it. Such are, we talking about, are we talking about learning right now? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I yeah. am. Yeah, and, okay. Yeah, I got you. I'm with you. you know, I'm with you. Awesome. But it was a real crash and burn, you know, situation. And I didn't give up. But, uh, and I mean, we struggle on and we're still connected. We still continue our work. And this is how we feel about it. We have a duty. And this was imparted in the book, especially here at the end. You know, you left with like, uh, my work, this was a happy ending, you're getting out, but my work has just begun. And that's, that's how I feel. And, you know, that we have, in a, in a way, we got to be like the evangelists, right? We got to spread the gospel here. But that's class consciousness, that we are not going to win if we don't come together behind this fights that we all have in common. And that includes, you know, the recognition of the things that our brothers and sisters have gone through that perhaps we haven't experienced, but it's part of our class story. God damn it, it's part of the American story. I mean, what are we in America if we're not based on slavery and the you know stealing of Mexico and the taking of the uh, lands of the indigenous people? This, this is us. And our, our class struggle has been going on since the American Revolution. I mean, the American Revolution, the reason why ordinary folks got into fighting in it was because they promised us equality. They did, they promised us freedom and equality. And the Civil War promised freedom and equality. So these are the things people, we have to continue this fight till we get it. 
until we win. But I just wanted to point out one of the things because, uh, you know, I'm getting excited too about this whole thing about why did we have this? Why do we have Trump? Why do we have this uh, coalition around a real fascist social line, right? And look at the, the fight in Chicago here. We just got through trouncing uh, Lightfoot, or she got trounced. I, I actually didn't vote. <laughs> but, you know, she made all these promises to us. She was going to improve everybody's life. She was going to do this, that, the other for all the unfortunates in Chicago. And she did not do not one single one. Not only did she not do it, but she can't do it. See, that's the thing under capitalism, they can promise you the moon, but when they can't do it. I mean, I've seen some ordinary folks get into these aldermen positions and they're nice people when they go in, but you know, like we don't elect corrupt people, right? But they become corrupt. And part of it is they can't do nothing. That this system is, has them by the throat as well. So it can't be solved with the system we have. But look at what the, what ha just happened with Lightfoot going down. Why do people vote for Vallis? Now there wasn't very many people voting, that's true. But Vallis is a stone fascist. I mean, he's known for that and his position on crime is hire more police. Now, of course, a lot of Chicagoans, especially those in the worst communities, don't think that's the answer. But some do, or some just don't know what to think. And it's the same way we got with, you know, Obama promised the world, couldn't fulfill, didn't promise, didn't fulfill anything, lined up with the government, the bourgeois plans, we got Trump. And part of it is, is the American people have been lied to so much. They're half crazy. They're half crazy. They don't know what to think anymore. But they it, that's why I say it's so important for us to, to figure out a way to get them to unite because they can unite around what they have to have. And they're they're losing ground all the time. I mean, people are very disturbed. I'm not talking about everybody because it's not equal. But in the working class communities, we're disturbed. You know, we're, we're 12 percent of the renters are behind in their rent. That's that's right now. Right now. They never, you know, during COVID, everybody fell behind, et cetera. You know, got a little help with stuff from the government. Not much, though. 12% of the renters are still don't haven't paid the rent. <laughs> I mean, we've got, I've seen people eating out of the garbage, tents going up in every one of the parks, homelessness is increasing. So we do have, uh, we have an army out there if we would just go to them and talk to them. And I'm not saying you won't hear a lot of backwardness, you will, but you know, you can't always base people on what they say that that's something I've learned I don't know about the rest of you but people say a lot of stuff right mm -hmm. and sometimes you'll talk to them and you say things and they don't seem to agree and the next time you talk to them they're telling you what you told them last time <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it does it does work and and you, we have to go to the community there's the boots on the ground that means going out there talking to people so I, I'm get, I got to get off my soapbox and let y'all have a chance. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that was good, sister, because I think it did speak to um, Brother Shamako's question about what is our uh, personal and collective responsibility when it comes to the the dehumanization of people that we're seeing. I think it spoke both to the personal and to the collective. So that was All one right. question. And then the other question is, um, Sister Anna's question is, what, what has been our biggest takeaway from reading uh, Comrade Kwame's book here from a revolutionary standpoint? Sister Anna, you have your, your hand up, sis? Uh, yes, I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Um, okay. Uh, if my uh, GPS starts talking, just ignore it. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> I find in order for us to have an incredible testimony, we have to go through the fire. And that's through everything from 
um, being detained, I hate to use the word convict. A convict is something that's treacherous, but detainee is a temporary hold in which uh, the state, the city could do, and um, they do so illegally with these uh, private companies where they are just uh, uh, they are just taking over a whole lot of wealth behind that. But um, even down when it comes to finding the right organization and seeing that, okay, I'm, I'm in an organization, but it does not even align to what um, I'm reading. And uh, another thing that opened my eye, whether I am um, want to be with that organization or not, or choose not to, read the manual. And a manual that I uh, have read concerning an organization that opened my eyes that made that determination, um, is that organization really speaking for the people or is it based on someone's personal um, ideology or goal? And um, one thing I have to say is that um, I appreciate every little break that we had where we spoke about our own personal journey. And that really, um, you know, uh, encouraged me more in, in my fight, you know, as far as health is concerned. And Brother Kwame had mentioned about, you know, the most necess the necess um, necessity things that's in life, like um, water and um, just privacy, when you you know need to go to the bathroom, it means a whole lot, but a whole lot is not being provided to that. When people um, want to control, conquer, and destroy, and um, hopefully, like Leslie, Sister Conrad Leslie has said, it's not hopefully, but we need to get together, and we need to go out in the community, and we need to speak to the people that's out there because this is not just a race war, this is a class war. And if you can, uh, you know, either gather some Ziploc bags, put some socks, put some um, tissue, put some, uh, I, I was for putting like a $5 bill in there, but you don't want that money to go in the wrong area, but give the necessities of what people can do or just a gift card to get um, something hot to eat or hot to drink means a whole lot. And this is something that you don't need an organization, but you could do um, individually that can help your organization as well. And I just wanna thank everybody here for letting me see your, your journey um, as we read our current uh, legendary greats like Brother Kwame and get read uh, Brother Hyde Thurman. So um, with that in mind, Brother Kwame, are you thinking about uh, probably starting another, writing another book, because I'm sure with this first book, I'm <laughs> sure you can uh, put this right on screen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, my next book is, actually, I already got a book, uh, a children's book I want to put out. I wrote, I wrote that children's book when I was in prison uh, for my niece okay. and my baby sister. <laughs> so that might come out uh soon uh i might do that just uh with the money i make off the book tour uh to put that children's book out but besides that i was thinking about uh possibly my next book would be a political book and it's uh okay. showing my the political ideals some of the stuff i covered in there in summary but uh, something more comprehensive of what i see uh the revolutionary movement, some of the concerns that we need to take in consideration for our generation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just want to briefly mention, I'm very happy that you got a children book out there and please put it in our post because even brother Redneck was mentioning that if it's possible that the children can have, uh, you know, uh, a book read group like ours. So uh, this way we can help them along in a journey. So they can, you know, uh, take control and enjoy the art of reading, <laughs> like the art of war, but the art of reading, um, and get them more on the path on doing that. Um, 
And uh, he even mentioned, uh, is there any uh, children books out there that's recommended? And please, yes, um, make sure you uh, post your children book because I would just, just purchase it to read it and just pass it on to my grandkids and have them to actually um, take part in and just to talk about their experience to read it from um, your journey or your idea for our youth, because our youth is our future, which is the generation. <laughs> Black power. Thank you, sis. Uh, Zombie, you have your hand up? Yeah, I did for a second. Um, I just wanted to say, along the lines of what Sister Anna was saying, when we go out, you know, and, and take items, because we do this regularly up here, um, take items out to the homeless. I think that one of the most important things that we can do as, as far as, you know, talking about what we were talking about, about how society dehumanizes everybody is ask them what their name is. Oh, absolutely. Ask mm. them their name and call them by their name, you know, and, and shake their hand and, and give them a hug, you know, because, because they don't get that. And, and, and people walk right by them like they're invisible and mm -hmm. nobody knows their name and nobody knows their stories. You know, we had a, we had a homeless gentleman that lived in one of the parks in a small town that I lived in in California. And I would watch people just walk past him and not say anything to him at all. So my daughter and I went to a restaurant one day and we were getting food for ourselves and we bought an extra meal and we took it over and we literally sat down on the grass with him and ate lunch with him and asked him what brought him to where he was. And we found out that he was a homeless Vietnam veteran who had gotten addicted to drugs while he was in Vietnam. He was a lawyer. He was, well, he was in law school. He was in law school a lawyer. and voluntarily dropped out and went to Vietnam because he thought it was what he should do and became addicted to drugs while he was over there and came back and had no resources and no help. You know, I still remember his name was Kenneth. And, you know, so every time we would go downtown, if we would see him, we would buy him some food and stuff and just sit and talk to him and make them realize that there's at least a couple of other people in the world who still see them as human. You know, I think that is huge and respectfully with with a great amount of respect, Sister Anna, I disagree about not putting money in the bag because, you know, it's it's not our judgment on what they spend that money on. And if they take that five dollars or that ten dollars and go buy a bottle of alcohol and that's the only comfort they get that day. It's the only thing that takes them out of their circumstance for that small period of time. That's not my that's not my place to stop that. You know, I mean, I understand everybody has different opinions on that, but I don't think that we, we don't, we don't understand the, the circumstances that they're in. We don't have to live through what they live through every day. And I figure if somebody wants, I'm, I'm sorry, if somebody wants to go buy a joint or they want to go buy a bottle of alcohol, whatever, I give that, I give that money with an open heart and what they do with it is, is their, is their business, not mine. You know, I give it for the right reasons. So, you know, I just I just think that it's so important to not walk, not don't walk past that person that you see sitting on the sidewalk and act like they're invisible. At least say hi to them, you know, and acknowledge their existence and and ask their name. Stop and talk to them. You stop and talk to somebody for two minutes. It could make the difference for their entire day. And it's not going to make a difference in yours. You know, if you're two minutes late to an appointment, whatever, you know, that could completely change somebody's life because you, you recognize them as a human being and that might not have happened for a while. Right. That's it. 
Sister Anna, did you, did you want to say something? I think you had your hand. Yeah, um, briefly. Yeah, that was a hard decision for me to take. And there's some things where we feel that, oh, yeah, this is right. But then again, we could be oppressing somebody else. And you don't know what is someone's happiness, especially when they are in a ruckus or in a situation where it could be worse than ours. And one thing I have to say is that um, I have to give it to the individuals who are out in the street because they are the strongest individuals that can survive through many elements out there from the extreme colds to the hottest heat um, and still make it, although they are the industry. So I agree with you, what you're saying, uh, sister. Uh, one thing that I'll never do is um, won't pay us someone. And if they hungry, I'll definitely get the, take the time out and give them something to eat um, or see if I can give them gift cards or whatever. But, um, one thing I would never do, and I will protect anybody on this, if, you know, somebody, you know, talk down to them, I will be that, that voice and say, you got a lot of nerve. And I think I posted something on my page where this man spirit just broke down when um, there was other individuals that was condemning him because of his situation. And he said, I'm human too. I cannot go and look for a job when I don't even have the proper attire. I have the shirt where I don't even have a place to even wash my clothes. I have these pants because mm. I have lost tremendous amount of weight. I have these shoes in which I've been working, I'm walking so many miles and to just keep my sanity or find a place where I can have a little dignity, a little warmth, and I don't have that because I'm out here in the street. So there's a difference between those who are homeless. There's a difference for those who are homeless, which they are near to being homeless. So, you know, you never know your circumstances where money can't buy everything and money cannot control everything. But as far as being human and see your brother down or see your sister down is, is something that we need to help each other instead of keeping them down. So I appreciate your opinion, your, your statement on that. I agree with you. I would, it's a very tough decision or what is right to include in a bag. But um, I give from my heart and I would not stop from giving from my heart. And um, again, to hear Brother Kwame um, journey, you know, and I, every time I read every single word and every sentence and every paragraph and every chapter, from the front to the back, I say this is one strong brother. Because if you was in his predicament, what would you do? What would you do? Black power. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Sister Leslie. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that um, you know, like charity is a wonderful thing, especially when you need it and somebody gives you something because I've been in the, that position before and I know what it feels like, you know, it feels good and you, you love them, right? You, rec you recognize the love that is coming your way. But I think, you know, for a revolutionary, we have to, um, you know, we have to explore this, like, uh, because our mission is, you know, and nobody's saying this that our, uh, but I'm just saying our, uh, we've got to be real clear that we're not just trying to do what, what the government won't do, you know, that right. our, our job is to be able to discuss what it is that people need to do to liberate themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to help set the framework up for that. Um, and, you know, Andy and I have been involved with the, what, what's called the Healing Corner here in Chicago. And this young woman started it with, well, actually a couple of young women started it. And what it was around the whole thing of like, you know, where there was really dangerous corners. A lot of people got killed, right? In certain sections and a lot of shooting and stuff go on. And it got so that children couldn't go out in those neighborhoods, you know, to play without uh, their mothers fearing for their life. And so, you know, our friends would go out and set up um, 
all kinds of stuff on the corner and like you know maybe uh, we get uh, donated chicken and get all sorts of you know supplies and stuff like um you know things that people need and then there and we just set up a thing we called the healing corner right and then everybody would just come out and play and it was absolutely beautiful but i'll tell you what <clears throat> We struggled also to bring in the other component, right? Which was, we can't, we're not just coming out here to party, right? Because the moment we leave, the corner goes back to what it was. So how, how will we heal? How can we heal? And, you know, like we were struggling like around what kind of message to give around this uh, election recently, right? What, what kind of message can we give to the people? I mean, are we just going to say get behind the progressive candidate like he's going to solve everything? I mean, I'm not saying the guy's not not any good, but I mean, he's not going to solve our problem because, like I said, it's capitalism, right? The communities have to organize themselves. They are if they don't organize organizations where they fight for their self, right? They fight for what it is they need. They're not just backing up some guy who says he's going to give them something. This is the only way we'll ever be be strong enough, right, uh, to have the kind of power, people power, right, to to really roll on over uh, these cowards and uh, moneyed people that are running everything. So we got to figure out. I don't have all the solutions. I I want to give too, but I just realize that you got to be careful too because you don't want to look just like a social worker, you know. People don't pre particularly respect that. They come and take the stuff, they're glad for it, but it's not like you've left them with anything other than a temporary little fix to a situation. We have to bring working class, the ideas of working class organization to them uh, when we're doing this thing. And speaking of stuff to give away, I've been trying telling everybody I've got seeds. I've uh, got a huge package to uh, Veronica on the way. If anybody has community garden or something or people that they support like that and want any seeds, um, just let me know. Okay, I just need an address where to send them. I got. I just got a ton of them. I I work near a. Um, uh, food pantry and they're just get got shitload of them and they don't give them away so i'm taking it on myself to give them away <laughs> I oh, that's you, nice. <laughs> yeah <Alyssa>. yeah <laughs> awesome Alyssa, just yeah. send me an address where to send it and um and i'll i'll be happy to do that if you want to send an address to my email i can shoot you my email Okay, I actually saw it in the group of a message, so I can't even just copy it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it, can I just jump in real quick before of I forget? Course. Of All right. course. Um, it's essentially going along the same lines. I mean, Sister Leslie is definitely more um, articulate when it comes to talking about like the working class line and, and what to be talking to these people about and stuff like that. But um, just kind of going off of what Zombie was saying, um, I've made it a point in in my like distributions and stuff like that or even just like driving down the street and and when there is somebody like I try to have something in my car to hand them or whatever and I I started to like see the same kid on the street every so often and then one day I'm like looking I'm literally looking for this kid I like can't find a kid I don't know he's probably 20 something um I'm looking for him and I cannot find him and I'm like where the heck is he and I'm like I don't even know this kid's name so I, the next time I'm like, I'm gonna make it a point to ask him what his name was. So, and like, you should it, just actually acknowledging people as people, like she was saying, and not, not walking past them or whatever. Like I live in New England. We don't talk to, we don't talk to each other. So like, it would be weird to like walk up to somebody and be like, good morning. How are you? Like, we just don't do that. <laughs> Um, like but, us in, um, in the southern states. Hey, sweetie. Hey, yeah, no, no. I, like, if that happened in where I live, we'd be like, "Are you high?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's really weird. Like, I can get stuck in a conversation with anybody, and people will just be looking at me like, are you done yet? And I'm like, all right. <laughs> but, um, no, like, but it really is. I, like, I made I made it a point when we went out to the Cranston Street uh, Armory as well. Like, I wanted to ask these people what their names were. And, like, one of the things, like, you can just tell, you can see it in their face. Like, holy uh-huh. shit, they actually are interested in me as a human being. Or the other thing that one of the, or not one of, but like a whole bunch of them I've noticed. Um, so like, it, it's like a weird dynamic thing that I feel like they're used to dealing with um, being like chronically houseless or something um, where people are just constantly preaching to them. Like, and I mean, preaching like religion or what they should be believing or how they're going to be um, uh, saved at the end of the day or whatever, but like their soul, they- saved not like their actual physical body being saved by like i don't know socialism or something but like how you know and it's just constant these people will will the first thing that comes out of their mouth is hi my name is whatever or hi um i just want to let you know that i'm an alcoholic or i just want to let you know that i'm an addict and like i'm i'm both of those things previous in a previous life you know what i mean so it is absolutely not my place to judge um i do choose myself to like try to hand out like stuff because I just think that it's more useful personally um but like not that I wouldn't hand out a dollar if I had it I also just never have freaking cash on me but anyway not the point um but (laughs) um it's just it's a matter of like these people really don't they they aren't they aren't talked to as human beings and they're not they're they're not used to it and that one little tiny ounce of like hey good morning how are you like what do you need and I'm not here to judge you is absolutely huge like their whole entire face lights up even if your conversation is five seconds and I handed them a a thing of Narcan or a box of band-aids or whatever maybe they were like eternally grateful this last guy in New Haven like he hugged me like three times Uh my mom knitted a little not knitted I don't know what the hell she does she puts make scarf now or another but um she like she made a scarf and this guy was ecstatic he hugged me and was like tell your mom i said thank you this is the <laughs> nicest I've ever had in my life oh, you, know I mean? you see it in their eyes absolutely you absolutely. see the light in their eyes come back right absolutely Just even wow. even if it's only for five seconds i used to have this thing and i didn't mean to interrupt you Alyssa, no. but i used to have this thing on my door um, when I, at one of my jobs where I was a director of nursing and it was this quote by this guy and I can't even remember what his name was, but it said it was along the lines and I can't quote it exactly, but it was along the lines of we forget how much a caring word, a touch or a small act of kindness can change someone's life. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> You know, yeah. it was it was such a powerful. I have to find it again, but I I literally had it printed out, and like the front of my office door, the top of it was glass, and I had it printed, and I had it stuck on the door so people could read it from the outside, because I was like, if you don't have this kind of attitude, don't even bother to come into my office. You know, mm. if you don't if you don't believe that you are here for, if you're not here for a good reason. To change these, to change these people's lives, don't even come into my office, you know, and all it takes is that one little thing. When you see that light for even five seconds, it's, you know, that you reach somebody, they're going to remember you, that kid that you were looking for, Alyssa, I bet you he remembers you just as much as you remember him. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. His name was Payson, if anybody's seen him. <laughs> yeah, 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 but he'll remember you just simply because you treated, you asked his name and acknowledged his humanity. Right, right. And, and it's just like, sh- like it, it, there's, always, there's always an ulterior motive or something in most of the places, like when it comes to like, whether it be a nonprofit or a church group or a whatever. And I don't mean to like demonize anybody because I'm sure that the people that are actually out there, like walking around probably have the right ideas in mind, but it's always like, how do we get more people into our congregation? Or, you know what I mean? Like, there's always an ulterior motive. And it's just like, holy shit, these people are, are these people actually just here to like be here? You right. know? <laughs> when, when you hand them something, when you ask them their name, 
say hi to them, hand them something, and then go, okay, you have a good day. And you turn around and walk away. And they're like, I, I literally had one guy t- say to me, um, is, is that all? Is, are you, you're done? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, dude, have a great, have a great day. Yep. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's just, it's very simple. And it's the smallest little things that, that make the biggest difference. And like you were saying, it doesn't, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take more than 30 seconds to grab something. Today, I was a little bit crazy. I went a little overboard. I recognized somebody and I saw that she was having a bad day. And so I knew that I didn't have Narcan in my car. And so I went, went back home and then I started driving around in circles looking for her. Oh. I couldn't find her, but I ended up giving it out to a few other people anyway. Yeah. But um, it was, you know, it's just like, it, it, it's the smallest little tiny thing, just acting like a human being. Like, I, I can't right. say that I've, I haven't been in this situation in a very long time, but I have been in these situations before. I've luckily never been incarcerated for any extended period of time or anything like that. Um, but I have definitely been on the street and um, didn't feel worth a goddamn thing or, or even just being a bad lady. Like now I'm 33 years old. And like, if I walk around with more than one bag in my hand, I have the worst anxiety in my world, in the world. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm homeless again. You know what I mean? Like, it's just the littlest things you have no idea what anybody's going through or why somebody's acting the way that, way, way that they're acting yep. and yep. being, being a human being. Is I was really- on my, I was on my way home from a call the other night. And uh, um, last, like last weekend, and on my way to the call, I had driven past this group of about four people in a doorway together, um, you know, with their blankets and their bags and everything. And I was like, oh, shit, you know, I didn't have anything in my car because I had all my work stuff in there. So I finished up the call and I went back the same way and they were still there. And I literally just yelled out the window one of you come across to the gas station, you know, decide what you want to drink and what you want, what, what kind of sandwich you want, what kind of chips you want, let your, let somebody know. And one of you come across to the gas station and we're going to get you some stuff. Right. You know, cause we had, cause we have like uh, cash cards, you yeah. know? And so I took, I m- met this girl over at the gas station and I bought them all drinks and sandwiches and she's kind of looking at me the whole time. You know, I think she only trusted me because I had scrubs on. <laughs> but she kind, of, she kind of looking at me kind of funny. And I was like, all right, you guys have a good night and try to stay safe. You know, right. um, and then you flip, and- the other, flip the other side of the coin and you go back to like Kwame's book where these people have to literally go to the bathroom outside or right. any of these things. And then like the police's idea is unhouse them even more even more right destroy their right. tent and and destroy you know take away their three bags of possessions that they mm-hmm. actually have mm-hmm. and be like oh well we have two one one so call them like okay so what the fuck are they gonna do today right right you know well like and that's why that's why i like i i got and i don't want to go <laughs> on and on but i got on um i got on people's cases during the 2016 i think 2016 2020 i don't even if I can know anymore, um, the election when Pete Buttigieg was running for president mm-hmm. and everybody was like, oh, he's, you know, he's a gay man. He's so progressive. He's this, he's that. I'm like, dude, please. I'm from the city that he was the mayor in. <laughs> I'm like, let me tell you that man put spikes in doorways. He put oh, signs wow. up downtown. He put signs up downtown that said that you could be arrested for giving houseless people money. Wow. And he literally brought in a bulldozer and bulldozed down all of their tents and <laughs> stole all of their stuff. Oh my I'm God. like, That's yeah, crazy. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, no, you, you need to pay attention before you just jump in and think that he's going to be some, mm. some liberal <laughs> savior because he just happens to be a gay man. You yeah. Know? yeah, but, but him, him and his husband adopted a child though. So it's all good. Yeah. Oh, well, oh yeah, <laughs> twins, twins, right. Yeah. So, so yeah. They, they're, they're, they probably did that for uh, political reasons too. Yeah. You know, they're just but I'm cynical like, enough to do that. I wanted to, uh, if you don't mind me cutting in here. Oh no, thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, let me put my hand down here. Um, well, like going back to this question, like, you know, um, ter- you know, about how to uh, help people 
organize themselves so that they can liberate themselves. Because I think that's, you know, primarily, that's the best gift that we could give them, really. I'm not saying that all that other stuff isn't important. I do it too. And, um, but like one of the things like on the healing corner, uh, one of the, what these gals started doing is they realized they, they had a whole crew of, of women in particular, especially young mothers who were coming out there because it, it was helping their children have a place to play. And it just brought a positive thing on the street where everything was so, you know, dark and everything. There'd be flowers where people had fallen and candles and that kind of thing. And we brought so much play and life and it showed the side of the community that wants to live. And so these gals started organizing film showings at their house and they would invite like young people, especially a lot of young men, um, you know, who were probably headed, I mean, towards getting into trouble, right? And they, we would show like films that, you know, people were interested in, but that also we could stop like our book groups and have a discussion. And it was great. I mean, it was a real learning experience for everybody. You learned what they were going through and they learned what we had to impart to them. You know, our larger knowledge about the situation that was causing them to be in the dilemma that they were in. So I think it's really important to find those ways and share, share them with each other. Like what is working and how does it work? Find because this is what you all know if you're doing this, how hard it is, you know, how hard it is to find those ways of communicating and get and gathering the people. So I've watched the healing corner go from what was two women and piling shit into the trunk of their car, and me and Andy would go out, I would help them serve. And Andy would sit, you know, he's an artist and he would draw all the kids in the neighborhood. <laughs> there, oh, wow. There are literally thousands of children who have pictures of themselves <laughs> done oh. by Andy Willis. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it gave us a, a, a platform from which to be listened to. And, you know, to invite to other things, right? Like I said, the film showings or, you know, and, and giving people a book like Kwame's book or to read, right? Um, and it grew though from, from those two women and the two of us, and we are getting older and it's harder. Andy can't do that anymore. He used to draw till he would drop in the blazing sun of the summer. Until he had like a major heart attack and he just can't do that kind of thing anymore but it didn't matter all these people started joining and they have a whole crew of people now they can do anything they want to any neighborhood they want to and one of the things that they set down uh, right from the beginning you know one of our our leaders she would go up to the police and come around and they wanted to be included right and she'd say uh excuse me but um you're keeping the people away <laughs> <laughs> if you wouldn't if you wouldn't wow. mind, if you wouldn't mind going this is for the neighbors this is for the neighborhood you know we, right. made, we made it clear right from the beginning we weren't a like a cop friendly, you know, get everybody like connected to the police or some bullshit like that, that they got going. Out there. <laughs> but all I'm saying is, all I'm saying comrades is that you're doing wonderful, fabulous work. But if we don't figure out, and I'm not saying you're not, but we've got to help each other figure out the other component, you know, which is to deliver serious message to our class because they're going down. You know, their lives are deteriorating really fast and we can't, we don't have enough money or time to fix them all up. We, you know, with, yeah. with, our, with our goodies. I mean, we just can't do it all that way. Uh, I yeah. Think. I just want to briefly say, you know, um, Sister uh, Leslie, you mentioned that there was this like 12% of people who are, yeah. let me get it right, that face their homelessness, but, um, I know that there is close to um, 50, probably 60% of people who have already received eviction notices 
And um, I know in my state, in my city, uh, North of Virginia ranked number six in getting the most uh, eviction notices, not in the Eastern area, in the whole country. And I know um, right now, uh, as far as the state is concerned in the city, um, it's not much being done to help people who are homeless or houseless, but they want to turn Virginia into a resort city like Las Vegas. And they um, doing what they can to, to build all these MGM type of casino places around where I live. And um, there are so many people that's really out in the street. And um, it seems like um, now uh, when it's coming to leases, it's not 12 months. They trying to cut it down to nine months so they can continuously raise rain on people or a person property tax will be so high where it's un unaffordable. So, you know, when people say, you know, freedom is fine having your home. No, not when it's not your home. You know, freedom is reading a book. Freedom is actually uh, having a passport. But when it's coming to the land that's out here, is, is, you know, the question is free to land. But it seems like, uh, you know, a lot of people are being faced with all these uh, conditions and all these, uh, you know, situations where we all are like at the point of being one day away from being thrown out in the street. And uh, like Sister Leslie has said, you know, we really need to, you know, to, some, to, to come together as far as organization is concerned. And um, if most of the people get rid of these pettiness attitude um, and see what it's about to hit us really hard, yeah. they'll, they'll they get right on cue. But we need to do something. And we, we need to solve focus. And I live the the you're breaking up, Sister Anna. Yeah, she probably hit one of those spots. Yes. Uh, I guess you got cut off. Yeah, we lost. Uh, I got cut off. Yeah. No, I'm still here. Okay, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going through the woods. <laughs> but um, yeah, we need to just come together. That's that's what I want to say. I'm the, I'm pro June Williamsburg, Norfolk, Virginia. But I just see so much that's going on in here, and a lot of people are actually living in the street. The city is getting rid of all of the city projects. You know, so please don't think that, oh, no, this cannot happen to me. Yeah. Can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How many people did you say were facing evictions? Uh, um, it's close. It's 50 percent close to that. But I know um, Virginia, uh, yeah. Ham matter of fact, the city of Hampton, Virginia and um, Norfolk is among the top seven. Yeah, the top seven cities where a lot of people are getting uh, thrown out of their place. Yeah, Norfolk, bad shape. Yes, and Hampton too. And um, I know all the city projects, the city is getting rid of them all over. There's no, no city projects. They're getting rid of them and calling them sore eyes. Mm, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone, we are uh, past the two hours again. Kwame's got his hand up. We, sure we just don't, don't want to let it go. Kwame's <laughs> got his hand up for a while. Kwame <laughs> can, okay. let Kwame take us out. <laughs> yes, yes. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just say thanks everyone uh, for being on this project with us. Uh, we're going into High Thurman's book next, and then we're going to Aaron Dixon's book. And then after that, we're going to keep on going and going and going. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be yes. a permanent fixture of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Absolutely. 
Yes. Yeah, it's only going to get better. <laughs> but yes. I'm glad that we can start off with my book and y'all can uh, get an insight of who I am as a person, how I came to be who I am. Uh, it's called My Search for Answers, Truth, and Meaning, the Autobiography of Kwame Shakur. And uh, I see this last chapter really sums up why I became Kwame Che Shakur. You know what I mean? Like you got to go through the whole book. All those different things led up to me being Kwame Che Shakur. I don't talk about myself as being Kwame in the book, but that's on purpose. Uh, this is mm -hmm. showing what led up to who became Kwame Che Shakur. You know what I mean? And that's why I ended it on a chapter with uh, that, how it, uh, I got the name, how it inspired me and why the rest of the chapters of my life is is gonna be that moniker. Uh, one day I might even change it officially. Uh, right now I use both names so I can hide behind it sometimes. <laughs> like if I gotta get on an airplane or get a job and stuff, but yeah. I know at one point I ain't gonna be able to do that no more and I'm just gonna officially change it. But uh, but yeah, that's, that's all, all those chapters that led up to this last chapter became who I was and that's why I said when I leave prison uh, I realized Day Day had died like now this is the 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 more mature revolutionary scientific looking me and uh, this is how I'm gonna go when I walked out those gates that's that's what I became that's who I was that's who I am now you know what I mean so I'm glad again that everyone took a lot out of this uh, appreciate everybody's uh, contribution I couldn't do this alone <laughs> Uh, and the discussion part was really critical. You know what I mean? Having been able to go in here and really peel back the layers of what I'm talking about or your own life stories is what's going to get other people to thinking. You know what I mean? So now uh, tomorrow we're going to finish the epilogue. Uh, but yeah. go feel free to share uh, this uh, with other people because I listen to it at work myself. When I miss one, I put it on mm -hmm. and I listen to it and and, uh, yeah, so and I know a lot of people in this generation, they get a lot of their information like that. So yeah. uh, this is something that we can share with other people. And when we finish high book, Aaron Dixon book, do the same. You know, what I mean, this is how we can start to reach the population out here that might not pick up a book initially, but this might get them thinking yeah. like, yeah, let me check this out. You know, right. what I mean, <laughs> right. So, uh. I know Zombie, you, you got our, uh, your hand up. Uh, go ahead. No, just real quick, Kwame. Um, not to take not to take anything away from um, the Rainbow Coalition reading, but um, Chairman Subi is doing a book reading also for any of you guys that have TikTok. Um, he does. Uh, he's got Audible, and right now they're going through. Um, a book about um, Huey Newton's life. And he does that every day on TikTok at like between 12 and one. Um, and I don't know if that's, I think it's 12 and one his time. I caught it. It started about 1210 today. Um, just more of an opportunity to, to learn more. You know, the, the Huey Newton book that they're doing right now has been fantastic. And he's also using, he's also using that platform. He's using TikTok. The reason they're doing it on there is to raise funds for um, uplifting Puerto Rico. Um, so yeah, so it's been really enjoyable to go on and they don't have the discussion, you know, along with it, because you can't really do that unless you add a whole bunch of guests on TikTok. But it's been really nice to be able to just play that book in the background and listen, listen to it while doing stuff around the house or whatever. But so I wanted to give a shout out for that, too, since it's New Era Young Lords and, you know, it's just been really enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. And please Absolutely. put it in the chat. Please put in the chat as well, sister. Yeah, uh, I'll have to try to remember what his. <laughs> I have to try to remember what his um what his at is on TikTok. Um, I oh remember. You got you got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, Veronica has a question. I know we're gonna upload this. I don't know if it's gonna be today. This recording. Uh, 
but uh, she was wanting to know, was you uh, uploading chapter 21 uh, uh, soon, uh, Shamako? Uh, Shamako? Uh, yeah, he's here. Can't hear you, Shamako. We can't hear. Can you hear me right now? Hello? Yeah. 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 I will be uploading that either tonight or tomorrow morning. Perfect. Okay. All right. Sounds good. It's been an honor, comrade. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Matter of <laughs> fact, I'm close to home now. I have that long. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we, we did. Uh, Oh we my just God. pulled up to our house about like what twenty minutes ago. Okay. We pulled up. <laughs> so this this oh got us through the whole trip from the, the hey. Chicago part to Indianapolis. Wow. Hey, Veronica, <laughs> uh, Sister Anna, can you count us out like you have sure. been? I just want to say that it's so cold blast every week, every, every Friday, I know. Saturday, Monday. It's always a new adventure. So on the count of five, four, three, two, one, Black Power, y'all. Y'all have All a good day. Power to the people. Uh, power to the people, comrades. <laughs>